Greetings, and welcome to the 80 Level Roundtable Podcast. In each episode, host Kirill Tokarev invites video game industry leaders to talk about the world of game development. No topic is off limits as long as it relates to video game development. New episodes are in the works, so remember to follow us or subscribe and share with someone you know will also enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much for joining and kind of sharing some of your time with us today. Um, Before we kind of go into the announcement itself, can you do like a little intro? Tell us what you do at Improbable and what are like the main areas of expertise? Yeah, sure. So I'm the the CTO for, for, for Improbable, Chief Technology Officer. I joined the company um, almost three years ago. Um, uh, Previously, I was a CTO at DreamWorks Animation, ran a a spin out from that business in the sort of visual effects uh, area. Um, I've been a CTO at Electronic Arts, um, built their mobile business in the the 2000s. And prior to that, sort of worked at a number of major middleware companies supplying technology into the games industry, all the way back to uh, Criterion Software in the renderware suite. Um, before that, uh, physics engines into the into the industry. So about 20 years of engaging and uh, on the technology side, both inside publishers, um, inside media companies, but also supply uh, as a supplier, a technology supplier. Um, my role at Improbable is sort of twofold. Obviously, the CTO role has a sort of strategic overview of technology direction, um, uh, but I also uh, I'm also an operator, so I run the engineering function as CTO. I also happen to be the GM of the IMS suite. So I'm also the business leader for our business servicing game developers. Uh, so you know all, all the um, customer engagements, the support and service, um, that's my business essentially within the framework of Improbable. Um, we have three sort of businesses. Uh, one is content development, our, t- our studios, the second is the IMS business, the, the, the technology and services business into developers and publishers in the industry. And the third is our defense business that actually services governments and agencies in the sort of training and decision support areas. So today we're talking about the uh, IMS, right? So this yes. is a problem of multiplayer services. So can you explain a little bit um, what does that include? And how is this different, or maybe it's not different, like from the previous offering that you? Yeah, I think it's provided. a really, yeah, really, really interesting and important question. So, um, Improbable began life as a technology startup, and it began life with a with a with a belief and a focus that interactive experiences would need to become larger and more dense and more populous, if you like, in terms of players, and that that was a critical factor for increasing engagement. The future was essentially dense multiplayer. Um, And so the the founding team really said, what are the barriers to achieving that? And they identified two barriers. One was the core, a core technology barrier, which is how do you exchange information between all those players? So a networking uh, issue. The second was scale. Um, How do you do all the compute necessary to support those many thousands of of players? Um, I think a third one that became very clear as they started to address this was, wow, this is difficult. (laughs) This is really, really hard. So only very, very few companies, very few teams on the planet have built up the expertise to successfully deliver you know, large scale MMO experiences. And that was evidenced by how many of these things were coming to market. And yeah, players really respond, but the volume is very low. So they framed all that in in an idea that they would create a package that would simplify development, would solve that core critical technology issue of interchange of information networking, uh, and would allow scale by um, rooting this platform in the cloud and um, allowing the cloud to provide the compute necessary to produce the outcomes for these richer worlds and more participative worlds. And that gave birth to Spatial OS, the platform, Spatial OS, the technology, and the way of going to market. Here's a platform, use it to simplify your development experience. Now, 
um, nothing, nothing um, survives. You know, that's a youthful, um, you know, startup mindset. Here's a problem. This is how we're going to solve it. Uh, none of these things ever survive contact with the real world. So uh, as people started to use the, the, that platform, started to use that technology, it had enormous sort of benefits. Some great games were designed because now people could see this uh, going. Uh, people that would, would jump into this new paradigm were typically quite agile, were quite aspirational, were smaller teams. And as we, um, as I think the company engaged with larger publishers and more experienced developers, it became more and more clear that first of all, there are many more problems um, the problems of online services, the problems of testing, play testing, and so on and so forth. So there's a range of challenges in putting one of these experiences to market that the platform wasn't yet addressing. And then secondly, the rigidity of that platform, here is a package, use it in this way, was just not really reaching experienced developers who had their own ideas about how they wanted to construct their games. And so Really, the, the journey of the company has been from that initial idea of a technology solution will solve this problem to one that's a little bit more sensitive to the way that our customers want to work, the flexibility that they need and the ideas that they have. So IMS is really a reaction to that. And uh, IMS has come about by recognizing that operations, the running of game servers is a complex problem all of its own. And we looked to an experienced team, uh, which is why we combined with the Zeus uh, uh, team to basically bring in not just a cloud-based solution, but also a hybrid solution. We could get to bare metal as well as cloud and give the right sort of cost equation for customers. Then secondly, the integration with engines, the different elements of an online and, and multiplayer game um, are, are wide, you know, data analysis, online services, engine and, and gameplay programming. So we combined with uh, the multiplayer guys to bring in expertise and the ability to embed engineers in game teams to help them get through those problems. So broadly speaking, what we've done is um, identify all the different areas, build expertise to be able to help our customers and take a much more flexible attitude to providing building blocks and then working with our customers to actually solve the problems that they're having in their specific games. So away from that monolith and towards a much more flexible, more sort of uh, customer centric approach. And that's what I am asking. Lincoln, so you did um, mention that you also had uh, like a content uh, direction inside the yes. company. And a lot of actually our readers and listeners on 80 level they actually participated in the development of uh, scavengers so some, yes. some of them really yes. exciting yeah so yeah. my question is while you were developing and running those games uh did you learn something did you kind of get some information that helped you package this new uh products uh, into uh, like a new uh, absolutely yeah i would say scavengers more than anything else was um in was was instrumental in the framing of what is um what goes into the ims offering if you like um it it opened our eyes to uh, development process it opened our eyes to ci cd to build challenges in build and release um challenges engaging uh play testers and how to do large large scale play testing challenges in optimizing both engine and server challenges in delivery of online services um what whether it's lobbies matchmaking social integrations with you know uh, discord twitter and so on uh and twitch um the a massive range of challenges that that team actually faced that we were able to build resources build solutions to assist and it gave us an insight into what it really takes to build one of these games. And really, IMS is a blueprint of scavengers. It says, these are all the areas, these are all the solutions, whether we, techno technologically, for example, we might not have that solution. An integration with a PlayFab or an, another company's technology is the right way to go for a particular customer. So IMS reflects all of that experience and it's really opened our eyes to the to the complexity, but also what what useful solutions are. We've had a chance to practice uh, with real, you know, with a real game, real yeah. real delivery to market to get it right. 
So uh, I am asked it has uh, a couple of different elements to it. So, and I would, I mean, uh, like a game server operation, it, it, it's kind mm -hmm. of like straightforward. We understand that everybody kind of yep. need to run servers and all that stuff, but live game backend solutions also kind of transparent and I kind of understand what's, what's going on there. Can you talk to us a little bit about like this uh, developer effectiveness solution? What does that in, include and in what areas are you, how do you actually improve that? Because this is something that everybody's struggling with. And yeah. uh, I, I had a talk literally yesterday with one of the like uh, big producers from EA and he said that every company that is doing games is doing them differently. Yeah. And there are, there's no framework, there's no nothing. And the, you know, everything is either, either delayed or there are mistakes or all the others. So yeah. how does your solution kind of help straightforward this process? Yeah, so so um, I, I certainly have a long-term vision that we should be able to achieve for games what um, the, uh, you know, what the platform business, the web app businesses have achieved for admittedly a much more simple architecture and simple go to market which is you know your devops and um agile processes with frameworks and approaches to iterative development um streamlined and automated that a lot of that is achievable but it's not achievable easily because game development is so much more difficult so much more complex and remember typically real time latency matters so end-to-end -end optimization, absolutely important. Transactional systems are a walk in the park in comparison. So you can't just pick up those techniques and say, oh, let's do that. So part of the uh, expertise of Improbable has been bringing those cloud-centric engineers from the Amazons, Googles, face Facebooks, and so on, you know, reliability engineers, but also bringing people out of major studios um, who have succeeded in elevating the test and iteration cycle um, to, to be a first class citizen. That's a really hard lift within game development. There's a reason for that. Game developers are experimenters. They're really, it's experimental programming. They're, they're, they're trying to find a feeling within the game and anything goes to try and find that feeling. And so the processes tend to be quite ad hoc. And that's really important for discovery and innovation and, and player satisfaction. But then these games actually have to get to market. And, and so all of those things come back and bite the teams. So what we're finding is that we don't want to get in the way of those initial exploration, those prototyping activities. That's best done locally. It's best done in a small team by any means necessary. But as the team scales, putting it in a position to offload builds, use cloud scaling to speed them up, uh, address friction in the pipelines, um, create some sort of standardization, but obviously we have to meet each team where they are. And teams are at different levels of maturity. They use different technologies. So it's really about a service that helps a customer improve itself. Um, that's how we work with Midwinter. It's how we work with our Edmonton studio to the point where Edmonton, for example, does multiple play tests per day with large numbers of, of, of players. And of course, you don't always have large numbers of players. Uh, with a small team. So we invented solutions such as simulated players. So you can actually have um, pre-player data played through your game to get to the scale of sessions that you're actually trying to design with, even if you only have a few live uh, developers. So you're still able to go through that iteration cycle every day. And, and that is the ideal, but it's a really difficult path to go down. And our job is to help our customers get one step closer and then the next step and then the next step until they actually have to ship. And it's going to be a process. Hopefully we engage with customers over multiple game cycles and we can help them improve. Um, the pandemic actually put a real accelerant on this because suddenly game teams had to work from home. Yeah. Um, cloud techniques, the scalability of that access, um, streaming, lots of different solutions really came to play to improve the effectiveness of a distributed team. Some companies will go back to the office, some companies will remain distributed. Um, it's gonna be a mixture going forward for the industry. No, oh, and I, I just wanted to add that the, the, the simulated player solution seems like a very interesting idea and yeah. something that any studio would use because even 
with the experience that Blizzard had with the new uh, the Diablo re-release, they <laughs> kind of, although they had all the experience, the server still fell, like, uh, and wouldn't work, right? So this is kind of something that everybody's struggling with, no matter how experienced you are, you, know, you, you can never tell. Exactly, and I think the idea that a developer that introduces a change into the game can compile, build, release, and then yeah. experience the game with the 150 player, uh, 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 as a 150 player uh, experience instantly is really, really important. Um, the, pro the, the efficiency of this design process is all about getting away from a guess and check. You know, you make a change, you don't really know what it means. Um, and downstream, you discover that it, it didn't really work. Um, you've wasted time. If you can see immediately that something is working or not, you can decide and move on. So that the, the efficiency of that of that test release cycle is so so critical. Sim players is a superb solution for this. By the way, you will have noticed that we are experimenting with ten thousand player sessions, and so you know instantly it's impossible to design experiences for 10,000 players without these types of techniques. And this is where the industry is going. So, uh, you know, we see an improved adoption of process an improved adoption of techniques like sim players as being one of the elements that can improve the ability of, the, of our customers to actually get great games out to consumers. Now, I'm guessing these technologies and solutions, they also help um help developers improve the game itself, improve gameplay mechanics and figure out new ways that players can interact with each other or with the environment. You have, um, inside IMS, you have the gameplay element solution and you talk about how it helps kind of overcome the traditional limitations. So can you talk about what those limitations are in your opinion and how does your product help go over? Yeah, so um, there are a number of things that read on gameplay. Uh, within the suite of IMS. Just simply, we have experts uh, and expert engineers that can join teams. Um, you know, we, we have over 200 engineers literally embedded in some of the biggest games in the market. So we're assisting, um, you know, major companies deliver their great games to consumers all the time. So that's that's a substantial part of our, of our effort. Um, so that it gets involved in gameplay, gets involved in the, the coding of AI and so on, all within those games. Um, in terms of solutions uh, that people can pick up and use, um, we uh, uh, have you know, developed approaches to networking that allow a company to explore, what does it mean to add AI to my game? Um, uh, can, I, can I add additional NPCs to my, to my sessions? Is that, is that fun? And there are two aspects to that. One is when you're experimenting, you're not optimizing. And so often you hit the limits of, um, of a game server. Um, you know, if you're using Unreal or Unity or your own proprietary engine, you just hit the limits immediately, you know, 10 players, 15 players or whatever. And it's gonna be way down in the project that you're gonna spend effort optimizing that. So one of the uses of this, uh, of this approach is to say, I'm just gonna use silicon. I'm just gonna run this in a multi-server way so that I can actually get that experience now, not in 12 months time, and see that my idea for that gameplay works or doesn't work, uh, and so on. So really accelerating the point at which you can get a feel for the experience helps you optimize your, your development. Even if downstream, you hone it down and you no longer need that extra compute, um, that's okay because it's, it's a, you're using it as a design tool. Obviously, um, customers are experimenting with leaving that sort of capability in their game so that larger sessions or more extensive AI or more physics, for example, these are some of the use cases that those techniques have been used to, to support. Still experimental, you can often say in the design phase, but nevertheless, you know, the industry, as it has done with all sorts of technologies, always likes more silicon and always finds good player uses for it. It's just a, a game of discovery, and that's our customer's job to find the fun, so to speak. Lincoln, so I have like, because uh, we have like oh, five minutes left, uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to ask like the last question. Um, so 
if, if we look at the uh, general market and we see all those companies out there, companies like you know Amazon, tools like Jira, and all those other solutions, uh, where does your offer stand? Look, where are like the main com competitive advantages, or how is this software different from solutions that other companies provide? We see on your page that you're working with Epic Games, that you're working with New World, but uh, like Epic Games has their own package of uh, solutions that they're providing for multiplayer. A new world is being developed by a, a company that kind of owns all, <laughs> most of the servers out here, uh, out there. And um, how are you different? Where do you see your competitive advantage? Where are like the areas that you, you know, serve best? Yeah, I I, I think that's a great question. So we have some really unique. Um, ingredient technologies such as that high scale de high density networking solution if you want very large player sessions. We have techniques for adding silicon to your play sessions such as uh, through uh, some of the uh, other networking products. We have a very good and efficient um, operations solution for running your game servers and we have um, flexible um, modifiable online services that you can use to start to customize matchmaking, uh, social features, and so on and so forth. In many of these areas, it, describing IMS as a set of technologies leads you to say, well, you know, there are, com there are competitors, there are other solutions for game hosting, there are other solutions for online services, there are other solutions for networking. Um, and that's all true. Our job is to identify areas where there are gaps, create differentiated products where we can, but embrace what's out there for developers to use and to solve the problems of integration, of process, of effectiveness. So I would say that what we're aiming to be and our differentiator is to be the one-stop shop partner for, for, for our customers. You can come to us and we will help you find the right solutions for your particular aspiration. We can help you with the technology, um, uh, we can help you with, the, um, uh, with, with process, we can add engineering to your teams, we can add expertise if you don't have it. So we're here to help you get your game to market and we'll reach for anything in the market or in our toolbox to basically help you do that. And in that regard, I think you know, we embrace all the cloud providers, we can get you uh, your servers deployed in small data centers at the edge of the earth to satisfy the fact that you happen to have a lot of players in this place in the world. So we can give you an effective go-to-market strategy. So we're really oriented towards the problems our customers have to solve to be successful with their games and bringing whatever is necessary to achieve that. I, I don't think there are many companies with the breadth of experience, the solutions and that openness to working in the way our customers want to work, um, available to our customers. And you know, it's proving very effective way of engaging. Um, we have lots of customers using different aspects of our, of our offering. And over time, we will be able to increasingly bring many of these packages together in patterns that people can use much more simply. Um, we don't have to own all of those pieces, but we can give the uh, the superstructure and the the scripts and the processes which will help streamline our customers' work and help them get to market quicker with better games and be more successful. That's our mission. Got it. Okay, Lincoln. Thank you so much. We're kind of out of time. Uh, we'll add the links to the description and the landing page so everybody could uh, check out the products themselves and ask questions if they have any. Right. Thank Perfect. you so much. And thank you very much. Day. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for enjoying another episode of the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. Check out upcoming episodes on the 80 Level website at 80.lv. Join our career site at 80.lv slash RFP. And share our podcast with friends and on your social networks.